Hi class, this is Professor Harmony Kim. Before you took with the term, you study how Buddhism transmitted from India to Central Asia to China through the Silk Road. Today, you will study Chan tradition in China with respect to the meaning, method, and characteristics. At the end of today's lecture, you will study the transmission of this Buddhist tradition to Korea as referred to as Sun tradition in Korea. Let's briefly review about Chinese eight principal traditions. These eight principal traditions were built while Xuanzang brought many Buddhist scriptures to the China. The first Salun school followed the Madhyamika Midway philosophical school of Indian Buddhism. Fasiang followed the Yuvachara mind only philosophical school of Indian Buddhism. Sarya Siddhi, just a Theravada tradition. Huayan, based on the Avatamsaka Sutra and dealt with an array of metaphysical concepts for contemplation. Tiantai took the Lotus Sutra as foremost and presented a balance between meditation, philosophical study, and good deed. Third period school, a method for purification based on strict observance of monastic vows and charitable actions. Chan Buddhism emphasized meditation and based on Lankavatara Sutra. Pure Land Buddhism practitioners strove to be reborn in the pure land of Amitabha Buddha or Maitreya Buddha. Let's look at San Lun School. San Lun School follow the Madhyamika Midway Philosophical School of Indian Buddhism. Narayana was a founder of the Madhyamika School of Buddhism. The Madhyamika School was known especially for the systematizing the perfection of Wisdom Sutra. Madhyamika means middle, middle way. The Madhyamikas are those who take the middle way between affirming and denying. Nagarjuna was among those who developed the Mahayana concept of emptiness and opposed the rigid categories of existence and non-existence, seeking a middle way between affirmation and denial. Nagarjuna believed that the way to salvation was the contemplation of unreality or emptiness. The doctrine of emptiness or void provided a new basis for Buddhist art because it became possible to render the Buddha without asserting that it was a representation of a true reality but rather a pale reflection of it main idea has survived present day in China, but not prevalently. These eight Chinese schools were propagated until the early 9th century CE. However, in the Great Tang persecution, so around 842 to 845 century CE, that dynasty persecuted the Buddhism. Therefore, Buddhism was severely repressed in China. All of the traditions except for Chan Buddhism and Pure Land Buddhism were essentially destroyed, although their influence remains and there is an interest in them today. So, among eight Chinese traditions, only two, such as Chan Buddhism and Pure Land Buddhism, were survived. The rest Chinese traditions getting weaker. 
After 845, Chan and Pure Land Buddhism became the principal Chinese Buddhist tradition. Both of them studied the midway and mind-only philosophy. Since the 16th century, Chan and Pure Land Buddhist practices have been blended together in many Chinese monasteries. So let's examine each Buddhist school, Chan Buddhism and Pure Land Buddhism in detail. Let's study Pure Land Buddhism first. You might hear about some melodious chant of Namo Amitofo, Namo Amitofo, means homage to Amitabha Buddha. This chant resonates in many Chinese temples and homes. The Pure Land tradition is rooted in the Sukhavati Vyuha Sutra as well as several other sutras describing how to be reborn in Amitabha's pure land. Amitabha's pure land is called Sukhavati. The meaning of Sukhavati is blissful pure land or western paradise. This Amitabha practice existed in India, although it was not as prominent in India as in East Asia. In the 2nd century CE, the Sukhavati Viha Sutra was translated into Chinese, and in the early 6th century, it became very popular. This practice fit in very well with Chinese culture. Taoist practice revolved around attaining longevity, and since Amitabha Buddha is the same as Amitayus, Amitayus is Buddha of infinite life. Therefore, people became interested in the pure land practice. Similarly, the Taoist concern with longevity was transferred to seeking reverse in Amitabha's pure land. These conditions enable people to easily adopt the pure land practice. In addition, times were hard in China during that time, and people welcomed a technique that was simple and direct so they want to get over all sorts of sufferings to enter Amitabha's pure land. This white panel shows the figure of Amitabha. So this Amitabha Buddha flanked by two chief attendants. One is Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara. The other attendance is the Bodhisattva of Mahasdama Prapta. Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara represent embody of the compassion of all Buddha, and Bodhisattva Mahasdama Prapta represent the power of wisdom. The Amitabha, flanked by these two Bodhisattvas, inspire many. Pure Land was not presented as an illiteracy practice, but one in which everyone, the illiterate as well as the scholarly, could practice. This means regardless of their educational level, they all could participate in Pure Land Buddhism. The immediate goal is to reborn in Sukhavati, the blissful Pure Land, in the next life. The long-term goal of this practice is to attain enlightenment for the benefit of all beings. Why is rebirth in a pure land desirable? In human world, sincere practitioners 
often face many obstacles. For example, they have to work long hours, thus have less time for concentrated practice such as meditation. There is crime and anger in society. People have to worry about money to support their families. Distractions from the media rule their attention away from practice. You are busy with watching YouTube and easily distracted from the media. In the pure land, such as Sukhavati, these hindrances do not exist. Everyone practices Dharma, and all the conditions, such as physical, social, economic, and so on, all these conditions are conducive to realizing the path. Because attaining enlightenment is much easier there, reverse in Sukhavati is desirable. If you look at the left panel, you can see the Buddha, whose name is Dharmakara. This Dharmakara was a pigu, according to the 2nd century CE Mahaparajuna Paramita Sastra. This Dharmakara pigu is none other than the future Buddha Amitabha, whose birth are told in the Skavati Vyuha. Sukhavati Pure Land came into existence as a result of the practice of a Bodhisattva monk, Dharmakara. Dharmakara Bodhisattva wished to create a place where other beings could easily practice Dharma, and Dharmakara built this wish many eons ago. Dharmakara made a series of vows in which he promised to establish this pure land when he became a Buddha and described the means by which others could be reborn there. Dharmakara then learned the Dharma from a previous Buddha. And Dharmakara generated the altruistic intention and complete the practices of meditative quiescence and special insight. In this way, he became the Buddha Amitabha and by the power of his positive potential and wisdom, Sukhavati came into present. How can people be reborn in Sukhavati? Some people believe that having strong faith in Amitabha and reciting his name are sufficient. Then by Amitabha's power, they will be led to the pure land when they die. In other words, when people rely on Amitabha, then these people can reborn in Sukhavati, where the Dhamma practice is much easier than this mundane realm. This is a rather simplistic view, and but there is some question can be raised. For example, the Buddha said that no one can save us but ourselves. We must practice Dharma and transform our own mind. Isn't it contradictory to say one need to have only faith and Amitabha will do the rest? Is it possible? The Buddha clearly defined that no one can save us but ourselves. In other words, you must practice Dharma and transform your own mind. You have to make an effort to yourself. The other party cannot transform your mind. But in this pure land Buddhism, you simply rely on Amitabha Buddha. 
then you can practice dharma and transform yourself. That is a little bit contradictory. So some scholars criticize the underlying principle of Pure Land Buddhism. How you think about this is all up to you. But I just introduced there's other opinion toward Pure Land Buddhism. Another flourishing Buddhism is Chan Buddhism in China. Chan is traced to a teaching the Buddha gave by silently holding up a golden lotus. In other words, one day the Buddha hold the lotus flower on his hand. Then the general audience was perplexed. The general audience cannot understand why the Buddha hold the golden lotus. But only one person the Buddha's disciple named Mahakasapa understood the significance of Buddha's behavior and smiled subtly. The implication of this is that the essence of the Dharma is beyond words. The Buddha did not say a single word. But Mahakasapa understand that. In Chan Buddhism, that essence is transmitted from teacher to disciple in a sudden moment, breakthrough of understanding. It does not need explanation, but mind to mind, the Dharma can be transmitted. The meaning that Mahakasapa understood was passed down in a lineage of 28 Indian patriarchs to Bodhidharma. Bodhidharma, an Indian meditation master, strongly adhered to the Lankavatara Sutra as one of Yogacara texts. So here is the list of patriarch lineage in India. So it should start with the Buddha. Shakyamuni Buddha transmit the Dharma to Mahakasapa. Mahakasapa transmit the Dharma to Ananda. In this way, there are 28 Indian patriarchs in the lineage of the Dharma. When teacher transmit the Dharma to the student, they usually give robe and bowl. The Venerable Mahakasapa received the Buddha's robe and bore as a proof of transmission of Dharma. This results in the first patriarch. The Dharma transmission from the Buddha to Mahakasapa was passed down in a lineage of 28 Indian patriarch to Bodhidharma. This Bodhidharma 28th Indian Patriarch went to China around 470 CE and he began the Chan tradition in China. This Chan tradition spread to Korea, Japan, and Vietnam later. Among 28 Indian Patriarchs, you can find here Aspagosha, in Nagarjuna, Arya Diva, we studied these three Indian patriarchs who influenced transmitting Buddhism to Central Asia. But it is Bodhidharma who brought Chan Buddhism in China. Bodhidharma went to China around 470 CE and began the Chan tradition in China. Chan in Sanskrit means dhyana, which means meditative concentration. Bodhidharma is said to have traveled to the Shanlin monastery. He lived in a nearby cave, and there he faced a world for nine years without speaking a word for the entire time. So as you see in this left panel, here's inside the cave, 
This Bodhidharma just faced the world and he did not say a single word for nine years. The first patriarch Bodhidharma in China attained clarity about the nature of mind while sitting facing a stone wall for nine years at Shaolin Monastery. Bodhidharma's teachings and practice centered on meditation and the Lankavatara Sutra. Since then, successive patriarchs have passed on mind-to-mind -mind realization to their disciples, hence it is called patriarchal charm. Patriarchal charm took root in China and passed over six Chinese patriarchs. So here's the list of patriarchs in China. So 28th patriarchs in India was Bodhidharma. So here's So Bodhidharma was the founder of Chinese patriarchal Chan. Then the Dharma was transmitted to his disciple named Hegel. Then Hegel to Sun Chan, Dosin, Hongnan, Henu. These first six great patriarchs in China were Bodhidharma, Hegel, Sun Chan, Dosin. Hongnan and Hanu. So from Mahakasapa, do you remember patriarchs in India? First Indian patriarchs was Mahakasapa. So from Mahakasapa to the six patriarchs in China, Hanu. Total 33 patriarchs carry the torch of the Chan Dharma. Bodhidharma transmit the Dharma to Hegel. So this panel shows the Hegel. Actually, in this panel also, here's the Bodhidharma and here's the first Chinese patriarch, Hegel. Initially, Bodhidharma refused to teach Hegel. Hegel heard about Bodhidharma and he approached Bodhidharma and asked for teaching him. At the beginning, Bodhidharma refused to teach Hagar. Then Hagar stood in the snow outside Bodhidharma's cave all night. It must be winter season until the snow reaches his waist. In the morning, Bodhidharma asked Hagar, why you are here? And Hagar replied that he wanted a teacher to open the gate of elixir of universal compassion to liberate all beings. Bodhidharma refused and said that, how can you hope for true religion with such a little virtue little wisdom, a shallow heart, and an arrogant mind. It would just be a waste of effort. Finally, to prove Hagar's reserve, Hagar cut off his left arm and presented his arm to the first patriarch Bodhidharma as a token of his sincerity. So if we look at this left panel, this figure shows only one arm of Hagar. Also, in this figure, you can see he cut his arm and show his resolute mind to Bodhidharma. So you can see he hold his cut arms. Then Bodhidharma accepts him as a student and put his name Hagar, means wisdom and capacity. Hegel used to have a headache frequently. So one day Hegel said to Bodhidharma, 
My mind is anxious. Please pacify my mind. Bodhidharma replied, Show and bring me your mind. Then I will pacify it. So Hagar said, Although I have a soul to eat, I cannot find the mind. Bodhidharma re replied, There I have pacified your mind. When Hagar brought his problem, Bodhidharma directly cured that. This is very powerful. This might happen during the time while Buddha was alive. When the Buddha gave a preaching, once they listened to the Buddha's sermon, they directly awakened. That is just a spiritual master's power and strength. Bodhidharma has passed a mind-to-mind -mind realization to Hegel. In this way, Chan tradition arose from the wish of some practitioners to make meditation their focal point. Let's think about the characteristics of Chan tradition to understand mind-to-mind -mind realization. In underlying principle in Chan Buddhism is that all beings have a Buddha nature. This Buddha nature is the seed of intrinsic Buddhahood. So everybody has a potential to be the Buddha. Some Chan masters express this by saying that all beings are already Buddha, but their minds are clouded over by affliction and obscurations. Some defiled factors such as greed, craving, and illusion can cover up the mind. Their job then is to perceive this Buddha nature and let it shine forth without hindrance. Because the fundamental requirement for Buddhahood is already within everyone. Chan Buddhism stresses attaining enlightenment in this life, not after death. According to Chan Buddhism, there is no need to avoid the world by seeking nirvana as well. This is because first, all beings already have a Buddha nature. And second, when they realize emptiness, they will see that cyclic existence and nirvana are not different. So nirvana at this moment in this life. Chan masters generally do not teach in depth about rebirth and karma, although they accept these. In other words, so this is different from Pure Land Buddhism. Pure Land Buddhism guide people to be reborn in another world, such as Sukhavati. But Chan Buddhism they stress there is no any other place, just here and now. When you practice meditation and when you realize emptiness, this is the place where you abide in Nirvana. Chan Buddhism is actually aware of the limitations of language and the Chan practice is geared to transcend these limitations. Experience is stressed, not merely intellectual learning. Thus, associating with an experienced teacher is important. Spiritual master is very important. The Chan master's duty is to bring the students back to the reality existing in the present moment whenever their fanciful minds get involved in conceptual wandering. So when you study, your mind can be daydreaming. Your mind can be in Hawaii, somewhere else, some imaginary place, but 
Chan masters make students' mind bring back to the reality existing in the present moment. This is illustrated by lively anecdote of Chan masters catching their students off guard and thus breaking through the confusion of their unrealistic views. Chan Buddhism employs the koan to develop spatial insight. So here's the methodology. Koan or Chinese kong an or some text write down kong an. Different koans are used by each teacher and each koan serves a different purpose. By the way, what is koan? Basically, these short puzzles, such as what was the appearance of your face before your ancestors were born? Or what is the sound of one hand clapping? Or who were you before you born? These kind of questions challenging one's usual way of relating to oneself and to the world. So this kind of question challenging ordinary thinking of way. One may use logic to approach the koan, but real understanding transcend verbal explanations and depend on insight into one's ultimate nature. The point of contemplating a koan is not to get the right answer. There might be no answer or unable to answer. Rather, it is to confront people with their preconceptions, becoming frustrated because the usual intellect and emotions cannot make sense of the koan. This method will make the sleeping mind will wake up. A koan cannot be answered by the discursive, superficial mind, but only by deep, deep insight. In daily life, Chan practitioners develop mindfulness in all actions, especially while even working. So whatever you are doing daily life, speaking, acting, working, just to try to develop mindfulness. Reflecting this, Chan monasteries in China altered one aspect of the vows of individual liberation and assigned Sangha members to do manual labor such as agriculture. So they plant crops outside the temple on the land and then they grow them and they harvest them. All during this process, they still cultivate their mindfulness. This originated from the need of the monasteries to support themselves in 9th century China. Nevertheless, Working can also be a good tool for developing mindfulness and being attentive to all one does, says, and thinks. While working mindfully, Chan practitioners cultivate the same inner silence experienced during sitting meditation. So internal serenity of mind does not always build up by sitting on the cushion. Even when they move, when they work, still this mindfulness can be cultivated. Work also reminds one that nirvana is not to be soaked elsewhere, but is actualized in the here and now. Although Chan Buddhism is a definitely Mahayana tradition, however, many of its spiritual masters 
do not give extensive and explicit teachings on how to generate this altruistic intention. Instead, they stress meditation and the arising of wisdom. The idea behind this is that once the ego's preconceptions are cut and emptiness realized, the underlying unity of all people and things will become readily apparent. Then, compassion and love for others will naturally arise. As the Chan tradition spread in East Asia, it included various cultural elements in its practice. This can be found when you see some difference between Chinese Chan and Korean Song traditions later. Chan Buddhism emphasizes simplicity in external appearances as well as in meditation practice. This was initially a reaction against the over-intellectualization of Chinese scholars. In other words, when Indian Buddhism arrived at China, many Chinese scholars philosophized Buddhist teaching. But Chan Buddhism just making this simplified. Therefore, this was initially a reaction against the over-intellectualization of Chinese scholars. At the same time, in addition, many people were overwhelmed by the variety of Buddhist practices and sought an explicit and direct approach. Nowadays, Many people's home and lives are often cluttered with physical and mental paraphernalia of life in a technological society. The seeming simplicity of Chan appears strongly to them. People enjoy entering an uncluttered meditation hall and appreciate the discipline of meditation. This is a part of a trans appeal in modern society. Some company or some school or even hospitals set a special room for meditation practice so that employees can engage in meditation when they have free time during their work. We study from Bodhidharma up to the sixth Chinese patriarch, and many students from Master Hanum went to Korea. So, from Chinese patriarchs, we will study Korean Buddhism. I mentioned that this meditation practice originated from the Buddha in India transmit to Central Asia, transmit to in China as a Chan Buddhism, now transmit to Korea, Sun Buddhism. So let's look at Korean Sun Buddhism. Here's China and here's Korea. Korea here, around 57 BCE until 935 CE, we call that kingdom Sila Kingdom. Sila sounds like what? Morality. The Buddhism stand up in two big pillars. One is Sila, the other one is Panya. Sila and Panya. Sila means morality. Panya means wisdom. Interestingly, the name of a kingdom is the same of this Sila. So this Sila kingdom governed from 57 BCE until 935 CE, and it is located in this part. So during 57 century BCE, there are three kingdoms in Korea called 
Kokuryo, Pekche, and Sila. The Chan Buddhism in China arrived to Korean Peninsula and it turned out to be Son Buddhism, S-E-O-N. So Son Dharma entered Korea at the end of Silla Kingdom. Korean monks who had studied in China received the Chan transmission in China and returned to teach Chan tradition in Korea. But it's not the exactly the same method. So Chan Buddhism in China modified in Korea, which is called Son Buddhism. Most of their Chinese teachers were Hanun's disciples. So the six patriarchs, Hanun's disciples, brought Chan Buddhism in Korea during Silla Kingdom. Also, the Buddhism can enter Koguryo and Baekje. Next time, you will study how Buddhism entered to Korean Peninsula. One way is through the land, the other way is through the sea loop. So maritime Buddhism. Let's look at Korean some Buddhism a little bit more. In Korea, the Hanung's disciples formed the Gusan Sommun. Gusan Sommun, I will introduce that a little bit later, but Gusan Sommun means nine mountain schools of Korean Sun. So there are eight principal Chinese Buddhist schools. In the same token, in Korea, there are nine Buddhist schools in Korea. But those nine Buddhist schools in Korea located inside the mountain. Therefore, we call that nine mountain schools of Korea. So, after Silla dynasty, the next dynasty is Koryo dynasty. Koryo dynasty. So Koryo dynasty unified Koguryo, Baekje, Silla and it forms one single nation, Korea dynasty. In continuation of the Silla kingdom, the Son Dharma kept entering Korea at the start of Korea dynasty, starting from 918 until 1392 CE. Most of Chinese teachers were Hanung's disciples, I mentioned that. In Korea, these monks formed the Kusan Sun or nine mountain schools of Korean Sun. In the Korea period, this Korea dynasty, these nine schools of Korean Sun became collectively known as the Choke Order. So all these nine mountain Korean sun schools unified and they become single order named Choge order. Choge order means the sun schools that had inherited to the Dharma of the six patriarch canon. Where are the nine mountain schools of Korean sun Buddhism? Here it is. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There's mountains in this spot. And inside the mountain, Korea monks set the schools. We call that nine mountain schools. And they practice Korean sun. What is Korean sun? How Korean sun is different from Chinese chan? And these nine mountain schools, they unify to form one single order, which is called Joge Order. So, in the Silla Kingdom and Korea Dynasty, these nine schools of Korean Sun became collectively known as the Joge Order. So, they all practice sort of Chan Buddhism, but it's not quite the same. That's why we call that Korean Sun, not Korean Chan. As like a Chinese patriarch, 
As like Indian patriarch, the Buddhist Dharma was passed to Korea, as you see in this list. This is the list of Korean patriarchs in the lineage of the Dharma. So, first Korean patriarch is Tego Bo Wu. And Tego Bo Wu master transmit Dharma to Honsu and continue to there is lineage, Dharma lineage in Korea. From the fact that Buddhism entered the Sila kingdom, which began 57 BCE, you will study the root of Buddhism and the Korea Peninsula and what kind of Buddhism was introduced in addition to Chinese Chan Buddhism. What is the main difference between Chinese Chan Buddhism and Korean Sun Buddhism? What is the route to introduce Buddhism to Korean Peninsula? By the land? By the sea? And what is special characteristic of Korean Sun Buddhism? All those things will be covered next week and following week. Which Buddhist schools are most active in China since Xuanzang has brought several forms of Buddhism. There are eight principal Chinese Buddhist schools. Which Buddhist school has survived from the persecution during Dang Dynasty? How could people believe to reborn in Sukhavati of Pure Land Buddhism? So you make an effort to be reborn in Pure Land such as Sukhavati. What you have to do? So you can find the answer from the previous slide. By the way, who introduced Chan Buddhism in China? So who is the first Chinese patriarch? Who brought Chan Buddhism from India to China? So you can find the answer from the lecture video. Okay, so you have to submit assignment so same way, send me and include your CC email and title subject. This is course code. In the main text, you write down your option name, last name, comma, followed by first name, and write down the answer of quiz. Okay, so this is the end of today's lecture.